Thank you, everyone. We'll begin today's session now. My name is Solimar Salas, Vice President of the Museum Content and Programming Department at the Museum of Latin American Art. Welcome all to today's MOLA Zoom project. We welcome you today, Wednesday, April 28th of 2021, to this edition of the MOLA Zoom project in conversation with the artist Patsy Valdez, where MOLA Chief Curator Gabriela Urtiaga will discuss with the artist her work. We also thank the Dwight Stewart Youth Fund, Rumba Foundation, Arts Council for Long Beach, and South California Edison for their constant support of the educational programming at the Museum of Latin American Art. In each chapter, our chief curator places the focus on a series of specific artworks, which require a close inspection and a deliberate process of contemplation and exploration, delving into the ideas surrounding the creation of the, of the works. They're sources of research and inspiration in an effort to immerse ourselves in the world of the artists. In chapter nine of the Mola Sum project, we get a close look at the work of the Chicana multimedia artist, Patsy Valdez. Patsy's work has contributed to a Chicana feminist critique of the socioeconomic and sociopolitical reality of the Chicano community living in the United States. Patsy Valdez is a multimedia artist and co-founder of the seminal collective ASCO, A-S-C-O. Her visual art practice includes photography, painting, paper fashion, and installation. Her work has contributed to the Chicana feminist critique of the socioeconomic and sociopolitical reality of the Chicano community living in the United States. Her artwork is included in major collections, including the National Museum of, the, of American Art at Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC, the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, the Tucson Museum of Art in Arizona, the San Jose Museum of Art in California, the Palo Alto, the El Paso Museum of Art in Texas, and the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach. Valdez continues making art in, when, in her Los Angeles studio. And I leave with you and introduce Gabriela Urtiaga, MOLA's chief curator, who will be leading today's talk. Welcome. Thank you, Solimar and all the MOLA team. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to MOLA. I hope you are well and safe, and thank you for joining us today. Hello, Patsy. Good to Hello. see you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for opening up your home to MOLA and our audience. It's a real honor to have you with us today. Thank you. Well, Patsy, I would like to invite you to start our conversation talking about your beginning as an artist, starting as a girl from East LA, you know, and if you can share with us your feeling and thought in the middle of a crucial historical context, like an act of commitment of a generation of young artists. Well, I'm gonna begin with a short introduction. So um, I was born and raised in East Los Angeles. I was raised in a single family home. My mom had to work to support my sister and I. And at that time I was considered a latchkey kid. The only advantage of that was that I actually had a lot of alone time. So there was really no adult supervision. So I was able to do pretty much what I wanted in the home. And that allowed me to come up with some really kooky inventions when I was a little girl. I remember making a pair of paper shoes and asking my little sister who's four years younger than me uh, if she could wear them to the corner store to see if they would last. It was I don't know what got into me, but what's ironic is later I end up making paper fashions, but I'll move on. So I always wanted to be an artist. I actually come from a line of creative individuals on my mother's side. My aunt paints, these are not full-time practicing artists, but she, paint, she was a Sunday painter, sculptor, and my two uncles were photographers and my other aunt could have been considered uh, a designer, but they never practiced full-time because they had to raise their, their children and earn money. 
So I was the fortunate one to be able to pursue this career. Anyway, yeah. I wanted to be an artist. And given my Chicana social background, I had to face many difficulties in becoming one. Finding my artistic voice was especially important to express my thoughts, opinions through my work about the injustices that were going on around me in my community, such as the police brutality, the racism, poverty, the inequality in our schools, and the sexism and violence against women. So all these issues were going on around me at you know, and I was aware of them in my first year. They really affected me in my first year of, or second year of high school. And that's when the walkouts happened. Anyway, finding my artistic voice was especially important to me. It was extremely important. And um, so I began making art about all these issues that were going on. And I addressed them through my performance work, my photography, with drawing and written language. I was intent in developing an identity as a Chicana and as an artist that was empowered, empowered unique, and I guess, I don't know, glamorous, but... Uh, so I really, these issues that were affecting me, my friends and my school, uh, I mean, I just couldn't rest. I had to address them. And I, the best way for me was to express my thoughts about all this through art making. Yeah. Well, well, according, according with your consideration of that singular and important time, Patsy, I would like to put the focus in the powerful group of public performances that you, you did uh, during the, 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 this important time, right? And we can start with Instant Mural from 1974 like a symbol of a lot of layer of meaning. And could you explain the main idea and what was your experience as a women artist? I think the first thing I want to address is uh, how the group started. Yeah. So, so basically, um, I basically, I'm, I wanted, I knew I was going to be an artist, but there were no like women artists or not. There was nobody around me that I could relate to that could understand what I wanted to do. So I used to see Gronk in the neighborhood. I, I, my mom would be driving us around and I would see this guy sketching and I think, who's that? And he always wore the strangest outfits. And I go, oh my God, I wanna know this person. So eventually through my little sister who was musically inclined and in doing a performance with Gronk called Cockroaches Have No Friends at the local park, she invited me to come and introduced me to him. And it's sort of funny because <laughs> Uh, he was, he had a very hypnotic gaze. You couldn't break away from his gaze. It, it was really strong. And so we chatted and then he said, um, would you like to be participate in the play? And I said, that sounds great. And I go, where are the costumes? And he said, over there. And there was this big pile of fabric. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, over there, you just go create one. So I went over to the fabric and I started putting stuff on, on my body. And then I, I got involved in the play. And so that was a long lasting friendship with Gronk. Uh, that was the beginning of a long friendship with Gronk. And then eventually, um, 
I was, uh, my, uh, the other person I encountered in high school was Willie Heron, who was an incredible, uh, he could draw incredible. So, uh, and then uh, there was Harry Gamboa, who I was standing in front of the school and this guy drives this little Volkswagen, zooms by and this guy is hanging out of the window with this camera and he snaps a photo. And I'm like, who's that? And then, so later on, he brings a photo to me and my friend Sylvia. And so basically we all, met in very unusual ways. And then we realized that we had very similar concerns about what was going on in our community. And we just started hanging out, having coffee, discussing things. And that's pretty much how the group started. And then we started illustrating for a magazine called Regeneración. So what we would do is we would have an idea and then we get in Harry's car, we'd find a location. And in this case, with the instant mural, there was a lot of murals going up in the, in the community. And we decided we wanted to make a mural that you could, you could make a comment on the wall and then you could just as quickly remove the art and zoom away. And um, that's where we came up with this idea of the instant mural. The only thing about this photo here is there wasn't just me taped to the wall. There's another person named Herb who's to my left, but he never got really any coverage. I don't know why they just focused on me. The, cool, the other thing about this piece is that I'd be there would be some negative comment about it saying, well, why are you allowing yourself to be taped to a wall? Da, 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 da. Yeah. Well, basically, yeah, I was taped to the wall because I became the piece of art, but you need to understand I also broke free. I, you know, I was, I liberated myself. So um, that's the part we don't see here. So, uh, that's the instant mural. Yeah, but well, the, the next performance, uh, so political and critical of the system too, uh, as a picture of that time, but also to the current situation is search and seizure from 1975, right? And could you tell us about your message in this particular piece and your approach and connection with the community? Well, basically this piece is about constantly being pulled over by the police. Uh, in my neighborhood in East LA, uh, I, we were con I was constantly being harassed by the cops. So I decided to make a piece uh, in response to that, and I called this what? Well, it's called Beyond My Control, and then Search and Seizure. And I had my friend Billy. I asked my Bill, my friend Billy, if he would come and help me with this piece. And uh, it was in response to constantly being searched. I could say in one year, I counted about being pulled over by the cops about 10 times. And it, I think it was the kind of car that I drove. So it's a comment in response to the police brutality in my neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, and well, uh, Patsy, I know, for example, that the city of Los Angeles was so important for you and for the group, of course. Uh, like a movie set where you could put many precious intention with the idea to transform established categories and injustice. In that sense, uh, we will discuss a la mode from 1976, a no movie movie, right? What yes. was uh, your formula in, in this uh, amazing work? Well, 
pretty much, you know, and I'm trying to find my answers that I had, uh, my, my uh, paper, the stuff that I had written for these pieces. I'm having a little trouble finding it right now. Could you give me one minute? To for sure. Find this, uh, what I wrote, because it's important. And I sent it to you, Gabriela, and I, for some reason, I cannot find it. Um, okay, don't worry. Just give me a minute. Oh, well, I guess I have to improvise. So, uh, Gabriela, since you have my responses when I sent you images and text, could you read a little bit about what I said about this piece, and then sure. I, I will further comment or um, why can I not find it? Yes, you you share with me a la mod is a still from one as con no movie movie. The idea for a no movie movie was posing for a still of movie that were never made no movies where our critic of absent of Chicanos and Chicanas from the Hollywood film industry establishment. Yes, so I remember that um, when I was young, I had, I had a lot of aspirations. First, I thought I wanna be an airline stewardess. Well, you're too short. Well, uh, maybe I could be an actress. Well, there's no roles <laughs> for actresses like you. Uh, so I was like, well, I'm not going to wait around. So basically, within the group, the cool thing is that we could create our own form of cinema. And I could play the leading role. And I didn't have to wait around for any, you know, Hollywood producer to come and discover. Mm -hmm. So uh, we made our own stills. Uh, our own no movie movies, meaning we didn't have a movie camera. So we would act out a still uh, in, the, in, in, in Los Angeles, we document it and then we move on. We actually invented our own uh, award called um, our no movie movie award, the Aslan award we called it. So we gave ourselves our own, uh, award for best, I won best uh, female actress, I think mm -hmm. that year. So we were just sort of having fun, but at the same time making commentary about how we were absent from the big screen. Yeah, and a lot of, of your artwork is starting with a question, right? And reaction of something. You mean in this time or? Yeah. All well, deaf, well, that's why I'm saying it was in response to being absent in Hollywood, yeah. television. So we decided to become visible. Of course, of on course. Our own, on our own terms. And Patsy, after a, a period of work, uh, in the 80s, you create a particular group of artwork when your dear friend Silvia Delgado was your inspiring muse. Uh, we have here Silvia Delgado in purple and black vinyl portrait of Silvia Delgado. What uh, do the pieces represent for you, Patsy? And it will be fantastic if you can introduce us to the different appropriation, uh, appropriation that you are talking about. So basically, um, pre osco because uh, I was doing some, first of all, pre osco I would, um, the intent was, again, being invisible, mm -hmm. or the representation of Chicanos was quite negative. It was always related to gangs or, you know, something not very positive. So I remember thinking, well, where am I in this picture? Where are my friends in this picture? I'm an aspiring artist. Sylvia was an aspiring writer. And uh, 
so what I decided to do was start to document my friends. And um, so in Sylvia and Purple, but of course it's a hyper, it's sort of pushing the, the image to the edge, meaning like this purple image with those purple lips. Um, I would take the photo of a friend of my friends, and then I I love printing in high contrast uh, with high contrast paper, and then I would bring it home, and then I would start to experiment with color, and this is dye a dyed hand colored dyed photograph of Sylvia, which is now luckily owned by the Andy Warhol Foundation. They recently purchased it, I think it was last year. The one on the top, uh, I, liked, I liked playing and experimenting with my photography. Uh, I didn't like just the straight photo. So uh, the top image, I start to um, add vinyl and torn paper. I start collaging and start experimenting with this portrait. So basically these are portraits of my Chicano friends, mm -hmm. which again, we were absent. We were, we were invisible. And I, my goal was to make us visible. Mm -hmm. And in a way I shocked you, you know, mm -hmm. these, are in your face. They maybe could be disturbing. They're pretty wild. So I felt that I really needed to get your attention to so you could notice that we existed. And we also had something to say. Yeah. And um, well, in, in that um, direction, another important project uh, is downtown LA, right? From 1983. And of course, I have a lot of questions around this artwork, but uh, Patty, can you tell us about your creative process in this particular piece? And of course, continue to say why is important the presence of these people in this kind of work? So basically, uh, I, first I started doing very uh, intimate portraits of my friends. And then I decided, uh, I actually got funded to do this. These are three door skins and it was funded by Spark. So there was actually some money there. So I decided to go out and explore my city with my camera. I would uh, go downtown, I'd walk around, I'd shoot photos from different angles. I decided to photograph maybe not the very attractive part of LA, which you can see it's a bridge and um, concrete. Uh, so I collected all these photographs and I would print on large mural paper. And then I proceeded to collage. So the, the characters or my friends, Dee Dee in the middle, Charlie and Mario, their collage on top of the cityscape. And the, the, the city is also cut up in collage because I was trying to incorporate different aspects of the city. And the only way I could accomplish that was through collaging. And then there's my sister with the cane on the left and Gronk actually walking off in the distance in that collaged panel and with a speeding car going by because we're a city of cars. And then my friend Sylvia on the right panel. So I was trying to incorporate, and actually in the middle panel, uh, there's various uh, people of color there. So um, I was just trying to create, a uh, what is the word? I was trying to capture my and people of color yeah and cool this is my last photo I think I ever took because what happens with photography was very difficult to sell nobody wanted to buy a photograph mm -hmm. 
So this uh, piece was on exhibit at Barnstall Municipal Art Gallery. And luckily I got this phone call and they said, um, the ambassador from Germany's here and he's interested in this piece. So this piece lives in Vienna now. And what was cool is that I think because it captured LA, mm -hmm. I think he really appreciated that and had it in his private office and then took it off to Europe. So mm -hmm. that was like probably the first major photo I ever sold and the last for a while. Wow. And, and Patsy, after a period of work in, in public field, uh, you develop a personal universe through your large scale painting, right? Like a little girl in the yellow dress from 1995 and broken from 1992 that now is part of Mola Collection. But in both cases, you are the protagonist of your creation. You show us different moments of your life. You know, so I decided to paint myself. This is a photograph of me taken by my, I was by my uncle. I was being photographed since I was five years old or four. I think I'm four there. I was, I've been in front of the camera since four years old. And basically I found this little black and white photograph of my uncle took and I thought, oh, this is perfect. So I paint, I made a painting of it, but then I added the fissures below under my feet, which was representing the break, the breakage or the falling apart of, of my parents' marriage. So I thought, how can I depict that? And that's how I decided to do it. I thought it was very important a very important painting for me because it changed my life dramatically. That's, you know, the, the divorcing of my parents. And there I am in my innocent little yellow dress. And uh, well, my world is falling apart. Yeah, and I am curious about Broken, your self-portrait. Can you explain a little more about this painting? This is the first year I had a major exhibit in a commercial gallery. And I was to do a, it was a very large gallery. And um, I was, I had to make so many paintings in a set amount of time. The dealer who I felt would he would write me these letters. He wouldn't call, he would write and say, I hope that you're gonna do this, that, and the other. He was very negative and very demanding. And I was so upset about his treatment of me that I decided to paint those feelings out in this picture. So, Basically, it's from being stressed and upset that I, I painted it out in this piece. Yeah. And um, um, Patsy, the, the next artwork is a paper installation from 2013 inspired by the Pepper Fashion Show Asco Beauty in 1982. This is a, a, a unique piece, right? A little different from the other works that we discussed today. And you are talking here about culture, heritage, ancestors, knowledge. What is the idea behind this? So basically when the OSCO group had their first major exhibition at, at LACMA, I actually forgot the year, that wasn't that long ago. Um, 
a, a curator was in town from uh, from the UK, and she came to visit me, and she said, "We're we're planning to do Osco Part Two in the in in the United Kingdom, and I I would like to know." what you would have liked to, how would you have done it differently or what would you like to do uh, in response to this exhibit? And I said, I would love to recreate the paper fashion that I did many years ago, which is in the center on the stage. Um, and anyway, she went back. So I get a call and said, we'd love it. Mm -hmm. We'd love to come to the UK, recreate that one costume, and then I proceeded to make the uh, the 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 gown on the right has a film strip of me and Billy, and then it's uh, like a, I call it the go-go dress. Yeah, and it's uh, a a performance photograph on there, and then I did the uh, Aztec queen in the middle. And then I did a bead hen, uh, the one with the beagles and the gold on the left. And then because I'm in the UK and the queen's there, I thought, okay, I wanna make a queen. So I made the black queen. And actually what was so, what was cool about that is they, um, they had an assistant for me and his name's Nadine Chandri. And he and I really hit it off as far as two artists. So together we created the Black Queen and he's still my friend and hopefully he'll come to the United States again. So I would like to collaborate with him, but mm -hmm. basically it's a recreation or my reinterpretation of, a, of the paper fashions. The other thing is you can go on, on the website, Nottingham Contemporary. You could type in on YouTube, Nottingham Contemporary, Patsy Valdez, and you will be able to see, and we'll switch to the next photo, the girls. Yes. Wearing. I actually, they asked, they asked me could we actually do a real fashion show with these paper gowns you're making? And I said, sure. So here are my models from the UK wearing my paper fashions. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It was, no, it's amazing, but see. And well, I propose you to return on your paintings with the amazing Pan Mexicano from 2017. And this painting is so personal, but also political, right? Where yeah. you are presenting in a domestic scene, many, many symbols and historical references. Can yeah. you explain a, a, a little more about this painting? So basically, um, my friend was writing a, a book about Pan Mexicano many years ago, and she would read excerpts to me from her book. I don't know if it ever got published. I lost touch with her, but she would read to me about Pan Mexicano. And I was like, what? So I learned so much about Mexican bread and about the mixing of the indigenous and the European ingredients to create Mexican bread. So uh, I decided to put the, the Chicana here, me in that yellow dress and the little Europe Española on the right, because they're representing those two cultures that were, well, in the background there's, were be, the, we're being conquered, the boats are coming, Columbus is coming, we're being conquered, the mixing of the two cultures, and then, which is represented by the bread and by the two little girls. Um, so basically, that was the idea behind that piece. 
Yeah. So the person who owns it, Gastilo, from Ultimate de la Rocha, his daughter approached me and she said, why do those, why do those girls look so pissed off or upset? And I thought, wouldn't you be, <laughs> you were being conquered. But anyway, <laughs> that's the story behind that piece. Yes, it's, it's an amazing, amazing uh, piece, Patsy. And well, to finalize uh, this amazing analysis of your work, Patsy, I know that you continue to experiment every day with different materials and support because I know that this means a lot for you. And the, the last advert that, that we will present here is a, your homage to Didi, that you desire to pay tribute to your friend with a mixed media photo collage, right? Well, basically it's called keeping the torch burning. Mm -hmm. So uh, just recently, um, oh, um, just recently, Cecilia is um, won a uh, Andy Warhol grant to write about my photography. So as we were, as I was taking out images and sharing them with her, um, I started to re, let's see, I started to be re-inspired by my work from the past. And I, I started to, and I was, I'm better now working with paper. So I thought, oh my God, I want to cre cre recreate or create some new collages from these old photographs. And because my friend Didi, who was one of my models and friends passed away from breast cancer, she, that's why it's in homage to her. I thought, okay, I'm going to revisit Didi and I'm going to make this piece uh, in memory of her. So I've really been inspired by playing with these different high-end art, artistic papers and I'm planning to make some really large collages. So these are um, smaller pieces they're about two feet by four feet I think and I'm gonna so it's leading me to make some large collages and I'm really enjoying the process and it was all inspired because of Cecilia Bajaro Hill yes excellent well but it is it it looked great and if you agree, we will open the Q&A session. Uh, Jorge Sibaja uh, is the curatorial assistant, and uh, he can read the question from our audience. Um, well, yep. Well, everyone, Thank if you, you haven't sent in your, <laughs> if you haven't sent in your question, you can feel free to do so via the Q&A or the chat box, and I'll read them aloud for Patsy. We'll start with uh, Liz's questions um, that she emailed. Um, so Patsy, what do you think has been the main contributing factor to your success within the art world? I, I mean, I don't believe there's been success yet. I think that's to come because basically entering mainstream, the mainstream art world hasn't really happened yet. I mean, I've had maybe I, I i don't feel i'm there yet i in in i'll call it the bigger picture in the bigger picture of the art world i haven't had a major museum exhibition uh so i don't know i i mean i've been successful i don't know if the the proper word is successful let's just say i'm persistent I do what I love. I make comments about things that are going on around me, but true success for me would be to have a major retrospective in a major museum. 
Um, and then to follow that question of what moment or time period in your life was the most impactful to your work and or growth as an artist? Every period. There's always something to address. It seems like we've come full circle again with this racism, police brutality that has never gone away. I'm like, oh God, the same old story, it's still there. So basically every, every period, it's always changing. There's always something to address. Um, Patrick Frank asks, was your clothing an instant mural a very purposeful choice? Was my clothing, all my costuming, I didn't just get up and look like that. There was an intent and a goal behind the look. The thing for me was I, had, I, I made myself look a certain way to get your attention. That was the intent. Once I got your attention, then I could make commentary and then I could, um, yeah, once I got your attention, then I could bombard you with my comments or thoughts that were of concern to me. But first I had to appear larger than life where you probably wouldn't have even given me a second thought or look. Um, Sally asks, um, hi Patsy, can you say and talk about what, what were some of the influences in art on you and Asko in the early years? There was no art influences on me. It was my community. See, that's again, until I went to art school 10 years later, I, uh, I started being inspired and researching and, and being aware of other artists. But at the time, it was about what was going on in right around me, out my door. Those were the influences. And I was always inspired by fashion for some reason and rock and roll music. So those were my inspirations. Um, Liz asks, I, uh, I believe regarding some of your work that covers um, some of the more, uh, some of the, so, for example, like the violence that would occur in your neighborhood and things that you would see, um, if making work about those things helped heal uh, oh, yeah. some awesome. of those emotions re with relating to that. It helped address it. It helped, I think art can be very healing when you're, I've had other artists tell me if it wasn't for art, I would be, I probably wouldn't be here. So I think the, the process of art making is very healing mm -hmm. and very important because you get those feelings out of you and you put them out onto a canvas or a photo or installation or whatever. So yes, it's a very healing process. And that's why I feel fortunate when I was in high school that we still had art that was part of the curriculum. So um, it's a shame that we don't have that today. It's really important. Kenneth Gaines, I uh, wanted to say something that he wanted to thank you for all of your meaningful and impactful art. Uh, it's made a significant difference in the lives of Mexicanos, Chicanos, Latinos, and of course, today's Latinx. Uh, we look forward to your success in the international and US mainstream art world. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, if there are no more questions, uh, we can close the Q&A. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Jorge. Uh, Patsy, you are an inspiration and thank you, thank you so much for your time, for your generosity, uh, opening up your home to Mola. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you soon and thank you all of you for joining us today. See you in our next Zoom project. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Patsy. Bye.